So what happened was this. The, the forests retreated. These environments where food had been very abundant became uh, nutritionally stressed. The diet had to be expanded. The choice was simple. Expand your diet or die. Well, now, it's interesting. Most animals have a very narrow range of foods which they will accept. This reaches its greatest expression in insects, which some of you may have learned as children that if you find a caterpillar walking around on the ground and you just put it on the nearest plant and by chance you chose the wrong plant, it will die rather than eat that plant. Insects are very, very food specific. Most animals are. Now, why is this? You would think that it would be a better strategy to be able to eat a lot of things. The answer is foods are chemically extraordinarily complex. And chemical complexity is another way of saying potentially toxic or mutagenic. And mutation is the undoing of any species or any adaptation. So there is an effort uh, by organisms to avoid uh, it, isn't an, it isn't a conscious effort, it's enforced by natural selection. There is a tendency to mitigate against animals with broad food tastes because they are exposed to so many mutagens, things which split chromosomes and, uh, and damage genetic material. However, if you're faced with extinction, your back is already to the wall you can see the Grim Reaper drawing near. So at that point, uh, expanding diet becomes a perfectly credible uh, strategy for survival. And this is what happened to these formerly arboreal apes now descended onto the grasslands. They began to experiment with their diet. And in addition to the fruit that they had always eaten, they began to eat insects, they became carnivores, they began to evolve a hunting style. Uh, and I've personally observed in Kenya the, the food testing behavior of baboons, and I assume that it is very much analogous to the food testing behavior that went on in early uh, proto-hominids and early human beings. The baboon will approach something, a potential food source, sniff it, look at it, place it in the mouth, but not swallow, sometimes for as much as a minute, and then either spit it out or swallow a small amount of it and then wait. And then if there's no immediate negative feedback from this, like vomiting or burning throat or constriction of mucus production in the throat or something like that, the food will begin to be accepted. In this grassland, which was nutritionally fairly tightly drawn, there wasn't an overabundance of food supply, there was, however, a parallel evolutionary event going on to the primate evolution. And that was the evolution of various forms of large ungulate mammals, primitive cattle, gazelle-type animals, uh, wildebeests, horned animals, hooved animals of all sorts. And many of these animals had a style of existence in which they congregated in herds. Well, these herds of animals clearly represented the major um, uh, concrescence or deposit of available protein in this environment. I mean, if you could kill a two or three hundred pound uh, boss primitivogensis or something like that, there was more nutrition represented in that than in several hundred acres of the gathering of corms or the raiding of anthills 
or something like that. So the pressure was intense to uh, become carnivores, to focus on these ungulate mammals, and quite naturally what evolved was a kind of uh, nomadic pastoralism based on following along behind these large herds of animals. The other thing was happening that was happening was there were very large and efficient carnivores on the scene, the equivalent of today's lions and the saber-toothed tiger and the hunting cats of the panther type. And many um, evolutionary biologists believe that the suppression of our sense of smell has to do with our actually passing through a phase where we uh, predated on carrion. This is not a very pleasant thought, but what we were doing was letting the lions do the work and then we were coming along with throwing sticks and rocks and things like this, driving the lions and the panthers off these fresh kills and then eating this available meat. But it was pretty ripe in many cases. So there was pressure to suppress uh, olfactory sensitivity. Now, in fairness to these complex issues, I should tell you that another school believes that it was our bipedal gait, that once we lifted up off our knuckles and literally got our nose off the ground, then there was a, a kind of atrophication of the olfactory senses. So these two theories compete. But whatever was going on, there was interest in uh, these large herds of ungulate mammals moving across this grassland environment. And a whole host of animals were relating to them as the central source of protein. Not only uh, the large cat predators, but also the wild dogs of many types, up to and including, uh, you know, the great timber wolf that has been extinct since the last glaciation, and then down to dingoes, jackals, hyenas, uh, this sort of thing. So everybody was interested in these large herds of mammals. Well, a consequence of large herds of ungulate mammals are plenty of manure. Anybody who has been around cattle knows this. And here's where we begin to draw the circle of the plot tighter. Because manure, food that has passed through the double stomach of these kinds of animals, is the favorite medium for certain kinds of mushrooms. Mushrooms which are called coprophilic or coprolytic, meaning dung-loving mushrooms. This is to the preferred medium for them to carry out their life cycle in. And again, based on my observations of, ba of baboons in Kenya, I've seen them approach uh, cow pies, is the gentle term for these deposits of fecal material, uh, approach a cow pie and flip it over. What they're doing is they're looking for grubs beetles or, or immature beetle larvae, they understand then that the, the manure deposit is a vector for insect protein in this environment, and having a limited amount of energy, they look for food in the place where it's likely to be. However, by a marvelous coincidence or superb planning on the part of the extraterrestrials who rule the galaxy, you can sort of... <laughs> choose your poison. Ah, the, the lunatic fringe is not unrepresented. Good, good. Of which I m number myself uh, among them. Uh, yes. So, these, these coprophytic mushrooms, particularly Strophaeria cubensis, which is the one that is pandemic, meaning occurs worldwide, I have seen them in the Amazon the size of dinner plates. I mean, you can't miss this thing. It is the most astonishing object 
in the grassland environment. And after a period of rains, to walk out into a grassland environment and see these things by the dozens and then by the hundreds and always vectored in on the same cow pies that are of interest to these foraging baboons, you see then that by design or uh, destiny, the mushroom was placed directly in the path of the foraging protohominids. Well, uh, and would certainly have been tested for its food value in the same way that uh, uh, I described baboons testing other uh, plants. Well, aside from the fact that Strophera cubensis uh, contains psilocybin, it is delicious. It is delicious in the fresh form. Well, delicious is just a monkey's way of saying that it's good food. If you find something delicious, you will overrule almost all other signals coming off of it to chow down on it. <laughs> so the mushroom is delicious. Well, what then are the possible consequences of the inclusion in the human diet of a psychoactive compound like psilocybin? Well, it... Uh, has three consequences. And I believe that this simple three-stage process answers this supposed unanswerable question about the origin of human cognition and human value systems and language. And it's very simple. It's easy to understand. It doesn't require a leap to faith. Let's hope I can remember it. The first consequence of, of allowing psilocybin into the diet of a foraging, hungry protohominid of that type is an increase in visual acuity. I don't think this is widely known. Since psilocybin is called a hallucinogen, people might imagine that you know it distorts reality or you can't see what's really in front of you. Well, that may be true on a dark night on a high dose, but that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about an animal which is foraging, eating insects, eating roots, eating whatever it finds, and including in that a, a small amount of randomly uh, contacted psilocybin mushrooms. Roland Fisher, uh, psychologist, physiologist at the National Institute of Health in the early 60s gave psilocybin uh, to thousands and thousands of people and he studied the effect of low doses on vision and he built an experimental apparatus which had two uh, metal bars which were ordinarily uh, in parallel and by turning a crank out of sight of the graduate student or the person being tested, uh, he could deform the uh, relationship of the bars so that they would slowly slip out of their parallelism and into a skewed mode. And this is very straightforward, psychology one, perceptual kind of experiment and he showed very conclusively with thousands of people that on small amounts of psilocybin people could pick this up much more quickly they could they were asked to push a buzzer when they thought that the two bars were no longer parallel and the people who were very lightly stoned were consistently able to do this to grok this more efficiently than the uh, people who had been given placebo. And Fisher, who was a kind of a gnome himself, uh, said to me about this, he said, so you see, here's a case where taking a drug actually gives you better information about reality than if you hadn't taken a drug. Incontrovertible proof, scientific experiment, beyond argument. And 
though it may have no consequence uh, if you're dealing with a group of 25 graduate students in a class on perceptual psychology, visual acuity is the thread by which life and death are hung if you are foraging primates in a nutrition-poor environment. If you can't see the food you're looking for, the gentle hand of natural selection is going to quietly move you toward extinction. <laughs> so, uh, to give you an idea of the power of that chemical in that situation, think of it as chemical binoculars. It doesn't take, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to see that if you're handed a pair of chemical binoculars in a hunting situation, you're going to be a more effective hunter. So on that first level, a level highly unconscious, a level where these protohominids are simply trying to get enough to eat, those that were willing to accept psilocybin into their diet had a slightly enhanced probability of survival through uh, enhanced supply of nutrition than those who didn't. This is the first level on which the use of psilocybin would tend to outbreed the population that was not uh, accepting it into the diet. Okay. As we all know, there's more to psilocybin than increased visual acuity. At slightly higher levels, still well below the level of an overt, mind-boggling, psychedelic experience, uh, psilocybin causes uh, what's called CNS arousal, central nervous system stimulation. Horniness is another way of putting this because what CNS arousal is is a kind of restlessness, a kind of where's the action mentality, a kind of desire to go out and mix it up a little and the ability to carry through on that in a fairly convincing style to your partner. <laughs> In the, uh, in the dry parlance of uh, primatology, we call this increased frequency of copulation. <laughs> and increased frequency of copulation means uh, increased frequency of impregnation. I don't see how you could have that without the first. I mean, oven basters aside. So, uh, increased frequency of impregnation means more offspring are being born to the population which is accepting the psilocybin into its diet. And more offspring is the key to evolutionary success and to running your evolutionary competitors right off the road into the ditch. That's the key thing. He who out-reproduces his competitors, or she, of course, who out-reproduces competitors is going to find uh, itself uh, the dominant species in a given environment. So there's a two-step process where the first step reinforces the second step. We have more successful hunting, more frequent sexual activity, more food for the offspring, and the offspring are being raised by parents who have already accepted the mushroom as an item of diet and will pass that habit on to their children. So I'm sure, as you can see, it's beginning to push in a certain direction. Well, so fine, mushroom eating increases the success of protohominids, but how does it account for the emergence of the higher functions of the human cerebral cortex. Language, dance, art, poetry, song, symbolic activity of all sorts. What's going on there? Well, it is simply that if we now advance from the slight dose, we've advanced now to the moderate dose, if we now go on and imagine that people enjoyed this arousal, this social ambiance that attended upon 
including this item in the diet, there surely would have been reckless souls among them who would have followed Dr. Leary's advice that when in doubt, double the dose, right? Well, when you double the dose, uh, uh, profound things happen which are not easily calculated from the previous state of mind, which was just simply a state of uh, sleeplessness and restlessness. Hallucination and stimulation of the area of the brain that is called Broca's area and that we now associate with the formation of language. Spontaneous glossolalia is a phenomenon of high-dose psilocybin use. Glossolalia is a uh, linguistic activity that seems to be not willed by the ego, but that is just simply an upwelling from the dynamics and architecture of the organism. Uh, and in our society, we're familiar with it as a uh, phenomenon that has been appropriated by Pentecostal Christianity as a proof of the indwelling of the spirit. But in fact, uh, this phenomenon occurs in most societies throughout the world, and most societies associate it with an indwelling of spirit, whether they be Christian, Muslim, animist, or what have you, this spontaneous vocalizing of language-like activity is seen to be uh, a sign of special characteristics, what anthropologists call election, shamanism, in other words, magic, the ability to cast spells, the ability to weave story. It's all tied into language. And i it's just my personal opinion, but I would bet you, I don't know how we'd ever settle the bet, but I would bet you that language existed a long time before meaning because it is intrinsically some kind of neurological release of the organism. And there can be syntax in the absence of language. Uh, as an example, me dingwa huadia van galpai kektexi mi tichi ki putong agmo hue zambo fwa hakti mi din digi ki pihut. What this is is instant art, you see, abstract art, because the human organism is. Uh, brilliantly wired for small mouth noises. This is something that we can do for hours with very little, I'm the living proof of it. <laughs> I want to beat you to the punch uh, before someone points this out. Small mouth noises, our special province, and with it we, we weave meaning, we convey emotion, uh, we convey anger, and eventually we recreate the entire world of our imaginations. I mean, this is what culture is, is a kind of coaxing into reality of the structures of the human imagination through the medium of language. And it begins as poetry and it ends as, you know, structural engineering on the scale of the Golden Gate Bridge or something like that. Language. Language then sets us apart. And so it seems to me there is a direct linear descent through the use of this one particular psychedelic. It has to have been a grassland plant. It cannot require any preparation, even boiling or something like that, because we're talking about a level of human culture that is more naive than these processes that were added late. So it has to be a commonly met with plant, a plant of the grasslands, a plant requiring no uh, preparation other than that you eat it, and then it has to put in place a series of self-reinforcing positive feedback loops that lead to self-reflection. 
I think this is it, folks. I think this is where humanness came from. And when you realize that the straight people who've had the field all to themselves since Darwin, their best idea is that it was the coordination of the throwing arm, that it's the baseball pitcher who is the highest <laughs> exemplar of what it is to be a human being, because as soft-bodied, weak primates, it was very important to us to keep our distance from these large animals as we stoned them to death. You know, you didn't want to get within the sweep of tusk or claw as you were attacking these things. Well, you know, I'm as fond of the lump-cheeked hayseed on the mound as anybody else, <laughs> but I don't see him as uh, as the exemplar of humanity's march toward the unspeakable mystery of being. Uh, not when you not when you think about the truly titanic dimensions that are easily accessible to any one of us on psilocybin, and we have you know, 10,000 years of human history, philosophy, art, science, and literature behind us. And when we come up against uh, five dried grams in silent darkness, it's as awesome, as appalling, as mind-boggling, and as impossible to process as it must have been for those folks 25, 35, 55,000 years ago. It is a true mystery None of our science, none of our language has given us a leg up on understanding that phenomenon. 